This morning, if you looked at the uh, screens when you came in, uh, the title of the message is, Are You Blessed and Forgiven? Sounds like a great Thanksgiving message, doesn't it? Well, it's not your typical Thanksgiving message, and I would like us to look in the Old Testament this morning in Psalm 32. (laughs) Psalm 32, we're going to read all 11 verses, and we'll study from there this morning. Let's go ahead and and read, follow along on the screens or in your Bibles if you have them. David writes, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. He says, When I kept silent, unconfessed sin, He says, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. Think about the context. Think about the contrast between between blessedness and forgiveness and trying to cover sin, David says. Verse 5, he says, I acknowledged my sin unto thee and mine iniquity. Have I not hid? I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. God is speaking now. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with the bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout with joy, all ye that are upright in the Lord. Not upright in the sense that we're blameless and perfect, but upright in the sense that David made things right with God. Here's this 32nd Psalm. It's about being blessed, about being forgiven. And it's the first of 13 Psalms that, that has the word at the title of it there. If you look at the ver- before verse 1 in your Bibles, it probably says a psalm of David, Mashel. It's the first of 13 psalms that says Mashel. And the word Mashel, I was curious, the word Mashel means instruction. Now we know that all the Bible, all the Word of God was given for our instruction and for our admonition. But there's emphasis on these 13 psalms, and this is the first one. But it has the idea of thinking. Mashel has the idea of thinking and meditating and then learning the lesson that's, that, that's given to us. And it's the first of 13 psalms written for instruction. It's the second of six psalms that begin with blessed. Psalm 1-1, one of my favorite psalms, blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. This is the second psalm that begins with blessed, and just like it says in verse 1 of Chapter 32, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. This psalm is about sin. This psalm is about forgiveness. This psalm is about instruction regarding those things. And God puts this on David's heart to record this after his sin. Now, when we, when we say the word David, we usually are accustomed to hearing David and, David and Goliath or David and Bathsheba. David is writing on the tail end of his sin. 
with Bathsheba. This is after his sin of adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband. And it's hard, it's hard for you and I to understand and to imagine the depths of those sins. David, David is open here in this, in this chapter. He's honest as God certainly moves him to write of, the, of sin's consequences, of, of, of the need for forgiveness and God's desire and want and longing to restore us into a right relationship and bless us. And it's important for us to learn about this today. It's important for us to learn because it's about sin. Anyone here ever sin? Nobody. So I studied this for nothing. That's great. Well, Lord, we're going to be dismissed with a word of prayer, and we're going to go home. Of course we all sin. Of course we've all sinned and still do. And I have. And it doesn't just go away. It doesn't just disappear. The conviction from sin, the result on the inside of us as we read about David's life, the conviction from sin doesn't just dissipate as we wait. It doesn't just, it, we can't wait it out, the conviction of that. We can't cover it up. We, we, we can't pretend that it didn't happen. And, and as time goes on, it, it lessens and lessens and lessens inside of us. It doesn't, first of all, the Bible doesn't teach that. And secondly, if you're a person that's born again, you have the person of the Holy Spirit, you know that's not true. You know that's not true. But there's a part that you and I have to play in this. We have a part in it. Now, if you're 40 years of age or older, you'll probably get this story. If you're younger, you may, but you may not. But there was this woman, and it fits right in here with this message. I heard this. There was this woman who married a millionaire. She had wrong motives. But she married a millionaire. He died. And then she married a magician. He died. And then she married a pastor. And he died. And then she married an undertaker. Now there's a purpose, there's, there's a method to all this. She married one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. I gotcha. I gotcha. One for the money, two for... Now, it's going to be in your head all day, isn't it? <laughs> but listen, listen. People live their life like that. They live for the money. They live for the show. They know they're going to go, but they never get ready. They never get ready. What is it? What is it to getting ready? You've heard this for years. One out of every one's going to die. Every hundred out of every hundred's going to die. The mortality rate in the world is 100%. You can't beat the odds. Rich Harder preached a message many years ago, a Good Friday service over at Hester Community Chapel, and I'll never forget this. I know Jim has shared this for years too, but it, it was profound to me when he said it. 200 people sitting in the church, and he said, looking out across this crowd, 50 years from now, most of all of us are not going to be here. But you'll be somewhere. So what is it about getting ready? C.S. Lewis said, said, war doesn't increase death because death is total in every generation. We all go. We all go. Listen, if you, you're here today in the sound of my voice, you're not going to be here. Some of you are going to go young. Some of you will go old. But we're all going to go. It's important to be ready. Important to be ready. And we go as sinners in our sin, or we go as sinners forgiven of our sin. And there's a process for you and I coming to God and receiving his forgiveness. 
Now, I, I love this passage of Scripture. I want you to turn back. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19. And look what God says. If you mark up your Bibles, you might want to mark this up if it's not already marked. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. God says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. God says, I call heaven and I call earth as my witnesses. I've set before you life. I've set before you death. I've set before you blessing. I've set before you cursing. Therefore, listen, choose life. It's not, oh, and I've heard this for years, and I'm sure many of you heard this. It's not, oh, if your God is so loving, and if your God cares, why would he send anybody to hell? He says, all of heaven and all of earth are my witnesses. There is life. There is death. There is blessing. There is cursing. He says, because there is a choice, I beg you, I implore you, choose life. He honors our ability to choose. He loves us so much that he gave us a choice. Isn't that right? He said, choose. Choose life. Now, Numbers 32, in the book of Numbers, chapter 32, verse 23, the Bible says you can be sure of something. It says, but if you will not do so, Behold, consider this, think about this. You have sinned against the Lord, and be sure, your sin will find you out. Look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13. He says, neither is there any creature that is not, look here, manifest in his sight. God sees all, but all things are naked and opened Unto the eyes of him, that's God, with whom we have to do. We can't hide our sin from the Lord. You can't. And that's what David was trying to do in his life. You can't hide anything from God. He sees, and in his seeing, he says, choose life. Choose life. I am calling heaven, I am calling earth to witness and you are part of the process, choose life. Choose life. David was trying to cover his sin, and we're going to look at the verses here, but he was trying to cover his sin, and it was grinding him. It was wearing him out. It was grinding him down on the inside to dust. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, and we'll just look at the first verse, and I'll talk about this. But it says it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle. Look here, that David sent Joab. David sent Joab. David would have been safer in the battlefield. He neglected his responsibility and his duty because he was the king of Israel. He was to be in battle with his troops, but he decided to send Joab, and he sent back. And you guys know the story. You guys understand this story. You know it. He was on his roof. He was on his rooftop. And he looks across the rooftop, and his neighbor, uh, Bathsheba, uh, was taking a bath. Now, this is my own personal opinion. I don't believe she's completely innocent. She certainly knew who her neighbors were. Now, I remember preaching and teaching on this, not myself, but hearing it here years ago, that this was very customary to them because the sun in the Middle East especially would warm that water up. They'd get a hot bath on the roof of their place. But, but certainly she knew who her neighbor was, and she's up on her roof, and I'm not faulting her completely. But then David looks over, 
and he sees her bathing. And, and maybe he couldn't help the first glance. Maybe. Um, but he sees her bathing and, and, and the first glance. And I want you to know this too, that temptation is not sin. The Bible says that, 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 uh, that Jesus, our Savior, was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. Temptation is not sin. But what do we do when we're tempted? Do we follow through? And, and, and following through is the sin. But David saw her. He lusted after her. He, he wanted her. He desired her. He called for her. He had her brought in. And he had a sexual relationship with her. And she was a married woman. Now David was married too. He had other wives. And David was about 50 years of age or maybe just a little older whenever this took place. Well, after their affair, Bathsheba came back to David and she says, hey, I'm pregnant. Whoops. I'm pregnant. And now the process continues. Trying, David tries to cover the sin. And when he tries to cover it, he compounds it. He makes it worse. You know, he says, you know, all I got to do is get your husband, get Uriah back from the battlefield. Or if I can get him to come back from the battle, from the war, I can get him to sleep with you, uh, go to bed with you, and then we'll just say the child's his. He wanted to cover up his sin. And listen, there's, there, there's, a, there's a lesson in that for us because once we lie, once we begin to lie, and, 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 we, and, and, we, and we tell another lie to cover that lie, and then, and then we tell another lie to cover that lie, and then we tell another lie to cover that lie. Then, then what happens, the problem is somewhere along the line you can't remember the, your lies. And they will catch up to you. Once you begin covering sin, it compounds itself. Sometimes it even gets out of control. And David brings back Uriah. He brings back her husband out of the battlefield. And he gets him drunk. And, hey, Uriah, how are things going in the battlefield? Hey, why don't you get down and, you know, you're home tonight. Why don't you get down with your wife? Uriah leaves. David locks the door. Uriah lays at his doorstep. He has integrity. David wakes up in the morning and comes down, and Uriah is laying at his doorstep. And David says, what is wrong with you? I told you to go home and, and be with your wife. And, and Uriah is like, I can't. I can't. My brethren are in battle. I can't let them out there. By themselves, I, I, can't, I, I don't feel right. And so David, what he does is he tries a second time with all this. He tries a second time, but Uriah won't go. And so David signs Uriah's death warrant. He puts the death warrant in Uriah's hand and says, give this to Joab on the battlefield. And the letter said, the death warrant basically said, Joab, I want you to put Uriah in the heat of the battle up on the front lines. And when, and when the battle gets to its worst, when it gets to its most heated, most intense, I want you to pull your troops back, but I want you to let Uriah on the front line, De or Joab. And that's what Joab did. And Uriah was killed. And David is adding to his sin to try to cover his sin. He takes Bathsheba. Huh, he takes Bathsheba to be his wife. Now listen. We, we know that story, and, and, and we say, well, that's, it, it, here, here's what the people thought, no doubt of David. Oh, oh, David is a wonderful, gracious king. He's taken this woman who's pregnant. Her husband was killed in the battle, and, and he's taking her in. Oh, he, he wants to care for her. He wants to love her. He is so gracious. We have such a wonderful king. We have such a wonderful king. But, folks, that goes on for over a year. Until a man named Nathan, the prophet, Nathan the prophet, speaks. He says, David, there was a wealthy man. He had all kinds of flocks. He had all kinds of herds, David. He had need of nothing, nothing. In the same town, David, there was a poor man who had one little ewe lamb. And David, that lamb, he loved like it was his own child. And there was this traveler had come through, David, and he stopped at the rich man's house. And the rich man decided to make a feast for the traveler. 
And the rich man went down and stole the poor man's one ewe lamb. And he killed it and he slaughtered it. And he offered it up to the traveler for his feast. What shall be done, David? Now, David is dealing with this for a year. We read this scripture. He says, when I kept silent, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. God's hand was heavy on me. David had all of this going on internally. On the outside, he fooled everybody. But on the inside, he had all this going on internally. And in his anger, he told Nathan, the prophet, he said, this man should die. Now, the law didn't say that. The law said that that the rich man should return fourfold what he took from the poor man. So David superseded the law and said he should die. And Nathan says, David, you're that man. You're the man, David. And David was crushed. David was falling apart, and he ends up before God in repentance and and no doubt God is waiting for him to come and through the process David writes this song the Psalms are songs the Israelites the Jewish people would sing these these songs the the, the, the Jewish people would sing them and he writes this song of of Mashel the song of instruction And he says here in verse 1 and 2, he says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. David is writing this after the fact, and he's speaking about the blessings of being restored and having fellowship and receiving God's forgiveness. But he tells us several things here in these two verses. I want you to look at here. He says the problem with us, the problem with man, and he he names four things here. First one is in verse 1. He uses the word transgression. He, 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 he reveals this to transgression, to transgress. Here's what it means, to step over the line. You transgress something. You step over the line. God draws a line and says, don't do this, and we step over it. In Exodus chapter 20, in verse 14, the Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery. God drew a line, giving us that commandment, David had that. David stepped over it. He transgressed the law. He transgressed what God had drew uh, a line in the sand, so to speak. He says, number two, he says in the first verse, he uses the word transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. He uses the word transgression. He uses the word sin. Yes, sin is missing the mark. Have you ever sinned and went, doggone it, man, I can't believe I did that. You know, I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to be growing. I mean, we, we do that. We, we, we sin, and we're bummed out because we, we did something we know is not right. But then, sometimes we do it willfully. And that's what David did. We do it willfully. He uses another word here, the third word he uses in verse 2. He says, blessed is the man into whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. It's a word iniquity. It's a word that speaks of our human nature. And and, and Jim, I remember you preaching, uh, maybe not in this text, but this word and what it means, and I have it marked up in my Bibles. The word iniquity means twisted. It means crooked. It means bent. And that's the condition of the human nature. We're twisted, we're crooked, and we're bent. And it's been that way ever since the Garden of Eden. There's something inside of every one of us that is crooked, that is bent, that is twisted, and it's not the way it should be, nor is it the way that it will be in eternity. But that's the way it is. Today, that's the inner condition. That's that's the way it is of every human being. There's something crooked There's something twisted. There's something bent inside of us. 
And he uses a fourth word in verse 2. And in whose spirit there is no guile. King James uses guile. This has to do with deceit. Deceit. Because in David's life, he was transgression. He, 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 there was transgression. He sinned. Because there was iniquity, he tried to cover that sin. What he did, and, and that was deceit or that was guile. Guile. He also uses, those are, those are the four words, transgression, sin, iniquity, and guile. But he also uses four, or three words, I'm sorry, three words of pardon. Look at verse 1. Blessed is the man, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Forgiven. That means to lift off or, 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 take, or take away. No doubt when you and I are in the midst of our transgression, we're in the midst of our sin, and it's eating us up, and it's grinding at us away. And I told Pastor Matt this morning, when we were talking about this, I said, have you ever been to the position or the point in your life where you have just felt like inside you were being crushed and under such a heavy weight and such a heavy load? And he never did answer that. But I did because I felt that. I have felt that. But no doubt when we're under our transgression, when we're under our sin, and it's heating us up and it's grinding on us, there is a relief. There is a release when we sense him lifting and taking away that weight once we repent. That's forgiven. He uses another word in verse 1. It's the last word in the, in the verse. It says, blessed is the man whose sin is covered. And that word covered means to shroud, to, to, to means to take it, to take it out of sight. Listen, God is a holy God, to take it out of sight. It's like it's hidden from, from his eyes. It, it, it's shrouded, it's covered. And then he uses the third word in verse 2. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputes or imputeth, imputeth. And that means that is the canceling of a debt. Canceling of a debt. And isn't it wonderful that our debt is canceled in Jesus Christ? Isn't that wonderful? The problem is, it's not with God, but the problem is, in Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 25, the Bible says this, <clears throat> that choosing to rather suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. The problem is sin is pleasurable. Sin can feel good. Sin is deceitful. Sin is alluring. But sin is only for a season. The, the feelings of all that are only for a season. Proverbs chapter 13. Look at Proverbs 13, 15. And look what Solomon wrote. Proverbs 13, 15 says, Good understanding giveth favor. But the way, look here at the second part of this, but the way of transgressors is hard. The way of transgressors is hard. David first talks about blessedness, being blessed, the, the blessedness of forgiveness. And then in contrast to that, he says here in verse 3 and 4, when I kept silent, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. He says, Selah. I love the word Selah. It's a musical pause, and we've taken it to interpret it this way in the Bible. I want you to think about what I just said. I want you to ponder, pause, and think about this. David says the covering of my sin, and, and, and remember this, remember this, no human eye, no human eye knew, except for Joab, he had limited knowledge, no human eye knew what was going on. To everyone around King David, he was great, he was marvelous, he was gracious on the outside. The problem was inside. The problem was inside. It was an inside job. The problem was he was being ground into powder on the inside. He said in verse 4, for day and night. Folks, day and night. That's, 
that's like from that's like never stops. From day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the, the drought of summer. He says, the moisture of my very life was drying up. The moisture of my very life was drying up. God's hand was heavy. It was pushing. It was heavy on me. Day and night, I had no rest. None. And that kind of pressure, that kind of pressure on the inside, it, ca- it, it, it affects us. It produces effects in us. Spiritually and physically. It affects our heart. It causes stress. It, it affects our, our digestive system. It, it causes acid. It creates ulcers. It has physical and spiritual effects on us. And David said in verse 3, when I, was, when, I, when I kept silent, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. David said, when I kept my mouth shut, it was grinding on me. The pressure was wearing me out. Folks, and the thing about this is, it can go on for weeks. It can go on for months. It can go on for years. Do you remember the story about Joseph and all of his brothers? They threw him in the pit, tried to kill him, threw him in the pit. Thirty years later, they still had guilt. They were still convicted by that. When they ran into him, they said, he's going to kill us. They still had guilt. It grinds us. It wears us out. And we can sit here in this room this morning, and we can fool everybody around us. But God says to David, I want you to write this down. I I want you to write down this song of, of Mashiach. I want this song of instruction. Because, David, from where I sit, where I sit in glory, this is what I see happening to people who are in sin and not right with God. It's destructive. We can come into the church building and play church, but God knows that God knows what's going on in our lives. You can't hide it from Him. And He tells us here that there are effects in our lives with this. It causes effects. It hurts the body. But he says in verse 5, he says, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, unto God, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. David owns over and over and over again the problem. He says, I acknowledge my sin and mine iniquities have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. David owned that. Listen, and, and sure, and, and listen, th- th- I, I told you the different definitions of the words in transgression and sin and, and iniquity and, and all that. And there's a reason for that. Because sure, David sinned against Uriah and he sinned against Bathsheba, but that was secondary because he sinned against God first. He sinned against the Lord. Every adulterer is a liar. Every murderer is a liar. David, his life, he had great highs with the Lord. Goliath, the the, the paw of the bear, the mouth of the lion. I think that's right. All the, uh, the defeating armies. David had incredible highs with the Lord, but he also had this great sin. He didn't transgress against Uriah. He didn't transgress against Bathsheba. He stepped across God's line. God laid the line out. He he didn't sin against them in the sense that God is the one that set the standard. His iniquity, his bent, being bent, being twisted, being crooked, his iniquity found its twistedness against the standards that God had set. And because he stepped over the line, it affected his life. And by golly, it affected other people's lives. And it always 
always, 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 always does. Folks, and maybe in the process of this this morning, God is speaking to you. Maybe there's someone here that you need to ask forgiveness in addition to asking the Lord, but that's between you and Him. It's so important. We just went through the, 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 the book of 1 John. It's so important that God's people walk in the light. If we're walking in the light, then I believe that Satan cannot have the advantage on us. We don't like to say sin. We don't like to say my sin today. We don't like to do that. Our culture doesn't. It gives people a low self-esteem. Creates low self-esteem in people. Well, if there's unconfessed sin, it really should. It should create low self-esteem. Because the conviction that you experience is trying to drive away that person of self. Get rid of it. We live in a world that doesn't tell it like it is today. Drug addicts, drug addiction is now a chemical dependency. Alcoholism is a disease. It's a disease. So if you walk by a state store or you walk by the liquor store or you walk by the bar room, you may catch the virus. You may catch the disease. Adultery is now an affair. Things have changed. And it's now somebody's rights. Things have changed. It's now somebody's expression. Now it's politically correct. David says, verse 5, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. This is the only way out, folks. This is the only way out. God says, here is the song of instruction. The, the, a psalm of David Mashel. Here is the song of instruction. I have given this man, King David, tremendous freedoms. I have given him a tremendous amount of grace. I have given him a tremendous amount of light. He slayed a giant in my name. He defeated armies over and over again. In all of that light, having all of that grace, in all of that light, he sinned against that light and against that grace. And yet the Bible tells us he's a man who loves the Lord. The Bible tells us that he's a man after God's own heart. And God says, I believe that. And God says, because I loved him, because I love David, I will not let him get away with it. I ground on him. I was grinding him up inside when everyone else thought he was great. When everyone else thought he was wonderful and so gracious. But because of this deceit, because of this guile, I gave him no rest day and night. My hand was heavy upon him. Why? Because Hebrews 12, 6 says, The Lord chastens those whom he loves. And what he wants us to learn from verse 5, th this verse he wants us to learn this instruction. When I acknowledge my sin, when, when I confess my transgression, when, when I put my iniquity before God, then he forgives. When I confess my transgression, David said that. I confess I will confess my transgressions, not, not, just, not just given some sort of verbal slap. You know, I, I, I confess. Remember, homologeo, confess, agree with God. When I confess my sin, this verse, verse 5, to me, means life. 
confession, homologeo, I am agreeing with God. Not, not, this, not this garbage, Lord, I lied today, that's confession. Yep, Lord, uh, I stole today, yep, that's confession. Lord, I cheated today, yep, that's confession. Lord, I shot somebody today, yep, that's confession. No, 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 no. Confession in the Bible is confession with brokenness. It's brokenness. God, I have stepped over your line. I have stepped over it, and I have sinned. And be- because my nature is twisted, it's bent. And there's something inside of me that is inclined to sin. When I read Romans 7, and I see Paul going, that big tug of war, I'm thinking, oh, that's me. That's me. But there's something inside of me that's, that's inclined to sin. Lord, I know you're there. And I am being completely honest with you. I have transgressed. I have stepped over your line. Lord, please forgive me. And then he says in the first part of verse 6, he says, For this shall, look here, For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee, unto God, in a time when thou mayest be found. Folks, I want you to know that God is available today, right now, to forgive his children. Right now. Surely in the floods, the second part of verse 6, surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. God is going to rescue you. God will rescue you. Thou art my hiding place, verse 7. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. Lord, you, you are my hiding place. You, you surround us with songs of deliverance. David says later in Psalm 51, in verse 16 and 17, he says, Lord, for thou desirest not sacrifice. Do you know why he didn't desire sacrifice? Be- folks, there was no sacrifice for adultery. There was no sacrifice that could be made for adultery. The penalty for adultery was what? Stoning to death. Death. Even for King David. He says, for thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. If that's what you wanted, Lord, if that's what you desired, I would have given it to you. But thou delightest not in burnt offerings. But here's what he delights in. The sacrifices of God are this, a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite or crushed heart. Oh, God, thou will not despise. And, folks, when we're in those places, that's when God restores. That's when he restores. Brokenness. David said, Lord, you are my hiding place. He says in verse 8 and 9, God speaks finally. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. The Lord speaks and he says, he says, I will instruct you. I will teach you. I will counsel you. And I will watch over you. But please, 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 don't be like the donkey. Don't be like the stubborn mule. Don't be like the ass in the barnyard. If you're carrying the burden of sin, if you're carrying the burden of transgression, and sin, don't be like the stubborn mule which needs a bit and a bridle to make it move. He says, confess. Agree with me. Why? Because I will instruct you, he says here in verse 8. I will instruct you. I will counsel you. 
I will guide you. I will watch over you. Folks, you and I have the ability to choose. God says, I call heaven and earth as my witnesses. I put before you life and death. I put before you blessing and cursing. So choose life. Remember Numbers 32, 23? We can be sure of this one thing. Your sin will find you out. Look what he says in verse 10 and verse 11. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord shall mercy compass him about. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy all ye that have made things right in your heart with the Lord. Folks, you can leave here today. You can leave the Beavertown Bible Church today in verse 3 and verse 4. When I kept silent, my bones waxed old. God was grinding him up on the inside. He was grinding him to dust. Look here. Through my roaring all the day long. It, it, some of your Bibles may say through my groaning. David didn't groan. If David was groaning, everybody would say, what's wrong, David? What's wrong, King David? Oh, my goodness, David, what's wrong with you? No, he said, I kept silent. But this roaring that he's talking about in verse 3 was on the inside of him. It was grinding him up. It was not allowing him any rest. And he says, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My moisture, my vitality of life is turned into the drought of summer. Think about that. You can leave here today in verse 3 or 4 in unconfessed sin. Or you can leave here in verse 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Folks, it's simply a choice. Don't play the game. Don't play church. Lord, I want to make this right now, today. Would you stand with me? Father, I thank you this morning for this example and for this letter of instruction. As the 32nd Psalm reveals to us, forgiveness and blessedness, but also the consequences of unconfessed, unrepented sin. I have no idea what's going on in the hearts and minds of my brothers and sisters today, but I know we're all sinners I know we're all sinners, and because we're all sinners, we have the capacity of sin. We have the capacity to transgress and to step across the line. But we also have the capacity to make things right with you. We have that choice. God says, I have set before you life and death. As as heaven and earth, as my witnesses, I have set this before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose. Choose my choice it's our choice to choose and he pleads with us to choose life i pray that for my brothers and sisters today here folks if lord if there's a need here today i pray that if if your hand is heavy upon a brother or sister here today and, and and they cannot take it anymore today that we'd be the day that you'd set them free from that that they would confess that that they would let that go it's time that we get serious about sin It's time that we get serious about the lines that you've drawn for us. Your your word is like guardrails going down the highway. Why is it so often, Lord, that I feel like I need to ride in the trees and down over the bank? Why can't I stay between the guide rails? Because there's a nature in me that, that is bent, that is twisted, that wants to do its own thing. But, Lord, I want to come back to you right now. 
I want to give my heart to you. I, I want you to free me from this. I want to, I want to confess. I want to agree with you that what it is in my life is, is going on right now is wrong, Lord. And it doesn't just affect me, my family, my kids, my grandkids. It affects my church family and all of those around me. I can't think of a better Thanksgiving message. I can't think of a better Thanksgiving message to know that we can come freely, make a choice to come to you, and you cover, you shroud, you hide our sins from your holy eyes. You can't see them. The Bible says you remove them as far as the east is from the west. If there's a brother or sister here today that needs to come, don't let them stand in, that, in their aisle today. Don't let them sit. Let them run into your arms today. And we bless you and praise you and thank you for your promise to forgive and restore. Thank you, Lord. We pray it in Jesus' name.